It is indeed a pleasure to be here with you this morning to open God's word with you on this day that's something of a heat wave, as I understand, in the midwinter <laughs> as the temperatures approach 40 degrees or whatever it is that uh, we will be blessed with. For now, we're blessed with the opportunity to open God's word together. If you would please open to Psalm 52. For those of you who are using Pew Bibles, you will find that on page 602. Psalm 52. Hear now the word of the Lord. To the choir master, a maskil of David, when Doeg the Edomite came and told Saul, David has come to the house of Ahimelech. Why do you boast of evil, O mighty man? The steadfast love of God endures all the day. Your tongue plots destruction like a sharp razor, you worker of deceit. You love evil more than good, and lying more than speaking what is right. You love all words that devour, O deceitful tongue. But God will break you down forever. He will snatch you and tear you from your tent. He will uproot you from the land of the living. The righteous shall see and fear and shall laugh at him, saying, See the man who would not make God his refuge, but trusted in the abundance of his riches and sought refuge in his own destruction. But I am like a green olive tree in the house of God. I trust in the steadfast love of God forever and ever. I will thank you forever because you have done it. I will wait for your name for it is good in the presence of the godly. Thanks be to God for his holy word. Let's pray together. Our gracious God, we come before you this morning, Lord, seeking, seeking your, the ministry of your spirit that you would minister to us through your word, by your word, and with your word. Strip away from our ears and from our hearts and from our tongues anything that would hinder the progress of that word in working your will in us this day and all days. Amen. Charlie Hebdo, New York City police officers, Ferguson, just to name a few recent, very sad events. Seems like every day we see the fallout from the actions of people desperate to advance them to their causes and elevate themselves. Got to get ahead, no matter what the cost. This is the driving, a driving thought in a sinful man. No matter what the cost, no matter what harm is done, man says, I am going to be the one who looks smartest, most powerful, most creative, cleverest. Substitute anything you like. Man wishes to amass fame, money, wealth, power. It is fallen man that the psalmist first addresses in our text. The title gives us the historical connection. The betrayal of the priest Ahimelech by Doeg the Edomite, as recorded in 1 Samuel 21 and 22. David, who was on the run from Saul, paid a visit to Ahimelech, the priest at Nob. Ahimelech and the priests were wrongly executed for helping David, with no knowledge that David had deceived them. The setting is historical, but the issue is timeless. Even though the mighty man appeared to win the day, the psalmist is absolutely confident of the victory of Christ over all such evil men. The psalmist exhorts all to rely on the steadfast love of God. Notice that the title calls Psalm 52 a masculine of David. The masculine psalms, if you consult the commentators, are often called psalms of instruction. Psalm 52, though, is not just a mere retelling of events. This is a contemplative, thoughtful psalm that asks a rhetorical question in verse 1. Why do you boast in evil, O mighty man? The Hebrew word translated in the ESV as boast 
is derived from the same word from which we get hallelujah. Glory might actually be a better translation than boast. Why do you glory in evil, O mighty man? From the psalm, we learn important lessons. The first is, fear not the deceptions of evil men. Look with me again at verse 1. The psalmist asks his rhetorical question in the first half, and then counters it with the error of the man's approach. This contrast is intentional. The psalmist points out that there is no purpose whatsoever in the, in the troublemaker's glorying in his own evil. It is God's love, not the love of his own evil deeds that wins the day. God's steadfast love is enduring. Based on a variant reading in the Hebrew, some translations say, Why do you boast of evil, O mighty man, and delight in mischief against the godly? Either way, the focus is on the evil man's misplaced delight. The mighty man is perhaps mighty in the eyes of the world, or maybe just in his own eyes. David continues to describe the nature of the evil of the so-called mighty man. Verse 2 says, your tongue plots destruction. The tongue of the evil man betrays the evil that is in his heart. Mark 7, 21. For from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery. The man's loves are evil, lying deceit, and words that swallow up others or devour, as the psalmist says. Doeg accused Ahimelech and killed the priests in order to gain advantage with Saul. Tell a lie so that you look good. Lift yourself up in your own eyes. Perhaps that approach will work for a time. You've all seen this. Someone who deceives to gain favor someone who tears down others to build himself up. All through the news, you hear of people who cheat and lie just to get ahead. Behavior like the serpent in the garden who deceives the woman in his battling with God. You know a Doeg. You know a Saul. Do you despair at the actions of evil men? Surely the death of all those priests and all the people of that town gave David some cause to blame himself. Like David, we're deeply saddened at the violent acts of other people. Paris, China, Africa. Yet the murders are the acts of despots and connivers. Just as in the garden, Eve is responsible for her actions. Adam is responsible for his actions and the serpent for his own. This psalm is not David's confession of sin, nor is it a lament that evil had won the day. Victory resounds in the psalm, whereas verse 5 teaches us, we are to wait for the justice of Almighty God. The psalmist declares that the steadfast love of God endures all the day, and David with victory in his voice cries out what this means. Derek Kidner points out the four violent verbs in verse 5. Count them. God will break down, snatch, tear, uproot the evildoer out of the land of the living. And here is portrayed a taste of how great a justice God will exact on this one who loves evil and loves words that devour. God will break him down, not temporarily, but forever. He will not be punished, but ripped right out of the land of the living. God's punishment for this one who glories in evil deeds is not for a day, not for an hour, but for all eternity. Broken down, no strength to stand. Snatched and torn from the tent, no place to lay his head. Uprooted from God's own land, the land of the living. No place to thrive. God's judgment is complete. It is eternal. 
David saw the deeds of Doeg and did not at that time see God's justice carried out. But he knew that it would one day come. David, the type of Jesus Christ, knew with surety that justice would come. Christ, who was betrayed not just by Judas, but by his own people, betrayed to his death. And yet in Christ, there is no despair. He has already won because he will be victorious in the end. At the name of Jesus Christ, every knee should bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, says Philippians 2, 10 and 11. He may have appeared to lose the battle for a short time at his death, but he has won the victory forever. This is the victory you wait for. The victory you know is coming. Let the ones who glory in their evil, the murderous ones, the immoral ones, let them believe for a time that they have, in fact, won anything. Almighty God prevails in all things. Friends, for all like David who trust in God, watch God work with reverent awe. Verse 6 says, the righteous shall see in fear. Proverbs 1.7 tells us, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Can you imagine yourself at that day, that final judgment? The incredible majesty of our God. It is and must be beyond our imagining. This is the fear of God of which the psalmist speaks. The holy awe in which you contemplate seeing him on that day. This figure, that God so holy, the angels fear to look upon him. The one from whom Moses had to hide in the cleft of the rock. And yet the righteous have no need to fear God's retribution. Paul reminds us firmly in Ephesians 2.8 and elsewhere that those who believe on the name of Jesus are made righteous by God. we are justified by God, not of your own doing. And so David, who himself deceived, engaged in a deception, did not need to fear the retribution of holy, majestic God at the judgment. But from afar, our psalmist looks on to what he knows is coming for Doeg, for Saul, for the unjust, for those who reject and hate God. He looks on at God with reverent awe and what he's doing. How much better to be able to look upon God with reverent awe instead of mortal fear when his justice is accomplished at the end of days. Second part of verse 6 says that the righteous will laugh at the so-called mighty man. It is not, friends, jeering. It is not jeering in verse 7 for the righteous to say, see the man who would not make God his refuge, but insisted or trusted on the abundance of his riches and sought refuge in his own destruction. The righteous won. It's not David. The righteous one is not you or me. The truly righteous one is the one who perfectly, perfectly obeyed the law of God. And that is Jesus Christ our Lord. The injustice, the injury that our Lord endured. No small pain of man could ever compare to what he tasted because of our sin. He is victorious. Who has the right to laugh but Christ? Who has the right to scorn the false refuge of the doegs of the world, the ones who turn to their own devices rather than seek refuge, seek salvation in God? Only those for whom he purchased the right to glory in his achievements have the right to laugh in him. All you who believe, the ones he saved, it is for you to flourish in the house of God. If you have ever seen an olive tree, you have seen something truly amazing. Twisted, large, dull green leaves, rather homely looking tree. 
and yet beautiful and majestic at the very same time. The majesty of the olive tree is the majesty of great age. And the fact that even after centuries of life, some have been shown to have lived for 2,000 years, they continue to bear hundreds of olives year after year. The translation in the ESV, green olive tree, doesn't bear full justice to David's image. The olive tree flourishes. It's not just green, it flourishes. And it flourishes seemingly forever. But friends, even an olive tree here on earth has a limit to its fruitfulness and eventually an end to its life. But imagine an olive tree in the house of God. In verse 8, David switches from the response of the righteous to speaking of a single person. Who is the flourishing olive tree? The one who trusts in the steadfast love of God forever. The fatal mistake of the evildoer is his trust in what is momentary and what is fleeting in his own life, in his own skills and abilities, in his own wealth, his own accomplishments. He ignores the fact of eternity, the very fact of eternity, and trusts in things that will prove to be his undoing. David assures us that it is God's steadfast love, his covenant love for his chosen people, the ones who trust in him for salvation that are the flourishing olive trees. Even still, there stands yet forever a flourishing olive tree in the house of God right now. The very Son of God who is in heaven preparing a place for you and for me who believe in his name. The fruit of this wonderful olive tree consists of believers who by God's grace through faith, which is itself a gift from God, have been made sons and daughters of the living God. And his fruit trusts in him wholly and completely. The olive trees of the earth, friends, will eventually go into the fire, even after thousands of years. But the olive trees of heaven, res resurrected in Christ, enter God's courts, rest in his presence, and praise his name for all eternity. And so, friends, rest your praise on what God has done. Verse 9 says it so succinctly. I will thank you forever because you have done it. There's a whole meditation in just the word it. David praises for his just, God for his justice that will come in that day, a day he cannot see. Doing one for a time, but a breath, but a whisper. David won a victory. He became king of Israel. But even David, the man after God's own heart, was not the promised king. But he knew that God had done it. God's promises, so sure, so exact, that they are accomplished in his time. David says, I will wait for your name, for it is good. Jesus Christ, name above all names, the one for whom David is content to wait. The evil man in verse 1 glories in his own devices and actions driven by evil. The righteous man glories in the mighty acts of the living God. God's sure victory gives those who trust him and those who love him the reason to wait. There is no need to try to take his victory into our own hands. There is no need for our revenge. Because trusting God means trusting the sure knowledge that his justice has prevailed in Christ who has come and will come again. See what David saw coming and know that God's victory is sure. Our Lord will put all his and our enemies under his feet. Teach this to the nations, brothers and sisters in seminary. Teach them to make God their refuge to trust in him, to know that his promises are sure. Sad as we are, and we will be, at the evil actions of conniving sinful men, we take heart and know that his judgment comes, and his victory over that evil is sure. 
God's name is good. His judgments are righteous. And his flourishing olive tree stands in his courts. Trust in him and rest in eternal victory. This psalm of instructions, brothers and sisters, is what we seek to teach in God's name. Teach people the futility of sin and the riches that come from trusting God and believing in the one to come, his son. The one who has come, his son. This psalm is the beginning and the end of our instruction from God's very word. Nine verses to teach us to turn from evil ways and make our refuge the king who saves. Make God your refuge. Trust in his sure promises and in his son, Jesus Christ, who saves. Trust in him and rely on the steadfast love of God. Let's pray together. Our Lord and our God, your promises are sure, more sure than we can know. But Lord, we plead with you, we entreat you to teach us by your spirit that everything you say is as good as accomplished. In your time, not our time. Help us to, to seek victory in you with our hearts turning toward the living God and trusting in you completely and wholly. And we thank you and praise you. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen.